thank you very much uh, for this display of Swiss discipline. Um, uh, well, we have started absolutely on time and in British universities the custom is to start five minutes late uh, and to finish five minutes early. <laughs> uh, but I can see that uh, that is not going to happen here. Uh, I am very happy to be here and I will speak, I hope, in a way that assists the interpreter uh, who is busy here in front and if you want to hear in German what I'm saying in English, be, uh, please feel uh, free to do so. Uh, we live in uh, very serious times uh, and uh, they are, it is not an exaggeration to say, world-changing times. And so what I have to say is serious, uh, sometimes it may be negative, uh, but I hope that nevertheless we can draw positive lessons uh, from what I'm uh, about to say. Um, it is, of course, uh, necessary to begin with uh, the events in London uh, that have happened in the last few days and also in Paris, in France. Uh, in London there was an attack on a soldier by two men who uh, regard themselves as converts to Islam and uh, at first the the media and also the government spokesman were saying that these were attacks by lone wolves. These were people on their own acting uh, from their own um, ideas. Uh, but it has gradually uh, begun to emerge as of course uh, I always thought it would uh, that there is in fact uh, a connection and that these people were not acting entirely on their own, uh, but acting along with others. And so the question, of course, both for Paris and for London is, uh, who were these people connected with? Uh, how were they radicalized? Where were they radicalized? And uh, also, who radicalized them? Um, Quite often uh, the tendency has been, and I've done this myself, uh, to say that uh, such actions uh, in different parts of the world are the actions of a small minority of people who are extremists, uh, who have been radicalized. I've just used the expression myself. Um, and yet, uh, the more I look at the situation in the Middle East and beyond, um, we can't just limit this to lone wolves or even to small extremist groups because what they are doing is taking place against a background. Uh, the background is not monochrome. The, the background is varied. Um, but it is a background of what we might call, for the time being, Islamic resurgence. Uh, that's a kind of neutral sounding word, I hope. And uh, there are, of course, uh, progressive and positive aspects to this resurgence uh, in many ways. Um, I have been for long friends with uh, Anwar Ibrahim, the Malaysian politician uh, who has just lost the election. Um, and um, with Chandra Muzaffar, who have been engaged uh, for, for a long time now in uh, the modernization of Malaysian society. And I have admired uh, to a very great extent the work they have done. I also have some connections with Nahadat al Ulama in Indonesia, again, a very large body of Muslim uh, professional religious people who have worked to uphold the principle of Panchasila, as it is called in Indonesia, which is uh, the principle that whilst uh, the, the government recognizes, the state recognizes various religions, uh, that no one of them is to be seen as more privileged than others. Uh, in India, uh, the, the work of Azhar Ali engineer, uh, is worth mentioning uh, in this context. Uh, and then um, in the Arab world, 
some of the work that the scholars uh, have been doing, some scholars have been doing in Al Azhar as Sharif, the premier place of Sunni learning, and particularly the work that was done by the former, I have to say now former, and thereby hangs a tale, the former Grand Mufti of Egypt, uh, Sheikh Ali Goma, uh, in issuing certain progressive fatwas, which of course now are in jeopardy, but we will come to that question in a moment. Also in uh, both Iraq and in Iran, uh, there is a, a stream of Shia religious thought uh, where it is possible to have dialogue on, on certain issues. Again, I will mention these in due course. So there is that, this aspect to the Islamic resurgence. But I think one also has to say, uh, and quite clearly, that in general, this is not the picture. From our point of view, unfortunately, this is not the picture, uh, because uh, in general, the resurgence in many places is marked not by being forward-looking, but by being backward-looking. Uh, I'll explain this by an incident. Um, some months ago, I went to see some officials in Iran, and I had Re rehearsed um, in my own mind that I would begin by talking about the great tradition of Cyrus the Great and to say how the Bible tells us uh, that Cyrus liberated people uh, in his empire and uh, that of course was the context for the return of the Jewish people to their land. So of course I, I said all this and the presiding officer on the other side looked at me for a little while and then he said, Bishop, uh, we are not interested in the past, we are only interested in the future. Well, um, is that supposed interest in the future really progressive or not? Uh, that is the, the question we have uh, to ask ourselves. And in, in general, I have found this looking back, that is what the word Salafi means, by the way. Somebody is always looking back to the foundations of something. Uh, always looking back, not only with nostalgia. I mean, we are all uh, guilty of looking back with nostalgia, but actually looking back with a specific and comprehensive political, economic and social program. Um, now, uh, this attitude is also characterized uh, by a suspicion of uh, plural societies where people of different faiths can live together. In fact, in my own experience, many such societies, the Holy Land, Pakistan itself, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, this, uh, where people were at, to some extent at ease with one another, the situation has been changed completely out of all recognition. Uh, so they are suspicious of a society like that. Um, obviously there is hostility to the West and to Israel. And there are particular tensions with Christians. Now you may say, why Christians? They're not only with Christians, but on the whole, I believe that the tensions, the special tensions between this kind of Islam and Christianity occur because both are missionary religions. You know, whether we like it or not, that is the reality. And they are now to be found cheek by jowl uh, in many different parts of the world, where even a hundred years ago, perhaps this would not have been true. Uh, I don't just mean Western Europe, but also many parts of Africa, for example. Uh, this happens to be the case. Um, so we are, uh, to a very great extent in these places, competitors. And that accounts for some of the hostility. Uh, if you asked me, as I'm sure you are doing in your minds already, uh, what characterizes this backward-looking aspect of the resurgence, I would have to divide it between Sunni and Shia. So as far as uh, 
Sunni Islamist um, extremist, if you like, agenda is concerned, uh, there are certain constant factors. Of course, there are differences from place to place, but there are some constant factors which I think it is uh, important for us to know. Uh, there is first the belief in the singleness of the Islamic Ummah, you know, the oneness of the Ummah throughout the world. Um, this is why uh, British Muslim young people are volunteering to go and fight in Syria. Um, and people from Afghanistan, etc., were in Libya and in Mali, and you know, well, you know the story. Secondly, uh, in uh, Sunni thinking about Islamic polity, the Ummah needs to have a leader. Uh, throughout the course of Islamic history, up to, 1920, up to the 1920s, there was such a leader known as the Caliph. Uh, at first the Caliph had to be an Arab of the Quraysh tribe, uh, but later on the Ottomans claimed to be uh, the rightful Caliphs. And the justification for the Ottoman claim to the Caliphate, because they were not even Arabs, let alone Quraysh, uh, was that they were the only leaders now continuing jihad. So that legitimated their claim to be the caliph. However, the caliphate was abolished in the 1920s, uh, after Turkey came second in, uh, among other nations in the First World War. And since then, uh, both moderate Muslims uh, and more extreme ones have looked towards the restoration of the caliphate. So the ummah and the caliphate, and thirdly the um, implementation of the sharia in a uh, way that is understood uh, by these people uh, who have been involved in the resurgence. Now. Uh, maybe we will have time to see that this is not the only way to understand Sharia, but that is how they understand it. And so the way in which Sharia has been enforced in, for example, Pakistan, is still enforced in uh, countries of the Arabian Gulf, uh, and increasingly so, um, and campaigns to enforce it in other parts of the world, uh, have a particular understanding of Sharia, uh, with which you will be uh, familiar to some extent. Uh, that uh, attachment to Sharia in that kind of strict form also then leads to the question how non-Muslims are to be accommodated in such a polity. And that leads us back to the idea of the Dhimmi. You see, the Dhimma was a particular way in which uh, the Islamic world accommodated Christians and Jews at first, later Zoroastrians, and later still even Buddhists and Hindus, which was of uh, minorities who were tolerated but under certain conditions, paying extra taxes, and not being able to do certain things in terms of their worship, propagation of their faith, uh, holding public office and so on. There are many conditions of the dhimma. So, uh, if you are uh, attached to uh, implement Sharia in the way many of these movements are, then of course the non-Muslims have to be treated differently from how they've been treated, for example, in the last hundred years. <coughs> and fifthly, of course, uh, in the, have I said four? I must have said four because I've come to the five. Um, <clears throat> fifthly, uh, the recovery of lands lost to Islam. Now which are they? The whole of the Iberian Peninsula, India as a country, uh, and of course Israel. I mean one of the questions about Israel is not the relationship between Jews and uh, Christians and Muslims, which is, of course, a very important point about relationships in the Holy Land. 
but in the view of these people who have um, uh, an Islamist agenda, the, the fact is that here was a land that had been conquered by Islam and is now no longer so, no longer governed by Islam. So that's the, if you like, uh, if you want uh, what is common in Sunni Islamism, these five things characterize it. Uh, Shia Islamism is, of course, as you may expect, uh, somewhat different. Uh, there is the same desire to enforce the Sharia uh, in the way that is understood. At the time of the Iranian revolution, there was some discussion about this. And I remember a senior ayatollah saying to me at the time that the real question in Shia Islam was the relationship between revelation and reason. And of course, there are still uh, uh, Shia uh, thinkers in Qom and also in Iraq. Uh, Qom is the, is the city in Iran uh, and also in Iraq who think like that. But on the whole, this has not characterized the revolution. Uh, take the punishment for apostasy, which um, in Shia uh, Sharia law, fiqh, in Shia fiqh, is punishment, uh, capital punishment for males uh, and indefinite confinement for females. Uh, but um, there is no statutory law in Islam prescribing the punishment for apostasy or even the crime of apostasy. Uh, an attempt was made to have such a law but it was defeated quite miraculously. Uh, even in such a situation in the, in the Majlis and in the Council of Guardians. But uh, Iranian judges of a certain kind will regularly invoke Sharia to try people for apostasy. Uh, I have been personally involved in some of these cases. Um, so there is that. However, uh, since the revolution there is a, a new understanding of theocracy uh, in Iran which is not really paralleled in any Sunni country. And that is the idea of what they call vilayat e faqih which is the rule of the religious scholar. That is what Iran formally is. Uh, it is a rule by Shia religious scholars. Uh, there has been a slowly evolving element in Irani Shia thought on this. Sometimes people claim um, that uh, this idea of Elayat al faqih was invented by Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, but actually, uh, my research has shown that as late, as early as the 1910 constitution, I think it was of the uh, country of Iran, that some room was being made to give Shia ulama supreme, uh, a supreme place in uh, lawmaking and in declaring what was and what was not according um, to the to, to to according to the Shia version of Sharia, what is a characteristic of uh, Shia uh, Islamism in Iran, for example, but also elsewhere, uh, is the I, the positive value that Shia Islam places on suffering and martyrdom. So during the Iran-Iraq war, I was in the, in the area at the time uh, and I saw those uh, plastic keys painted silver, the keys to paradise that were given to these young boys, teenagers, sometimes hardly teenagers, and they were pushed out to be cannon fodder for the Iraqi guns. Uh, but the idea that uh, martyrdom is something valuable um, and something to be desired characterizes Shia Islam in quite a unique way. Uh, you may say that the idea of martyrdom is there in Sunni Islam as well, but in Shia Islam it is directed to a particular end which is uh, 
the, um, the coming of the absent Imam. So if you fight for justice, as they understand it, if you fight for the supremacy of Islam as they see it, then that will hasten, that will hasten the coming of the Imam. And there is some evidence by Irani scholars themselves that the regime has used this idea uh, to further its own policies. Uh, so, you know, if, if you ask me what, what are you talking about, I would say that Sunni Islamism and Shia Islamism can be characterized roughly in these ways. Now, of course, there are some organizations that claim to be non-violent, even of this persuasion. Or they claim that they have renounced violence. So the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and elsewhere, claim that they have renounced violence. Yeah, I believe them. Okay. Uh, the Tablighi Jamaat in Pakistan, uh, Binyamin mentioned that I was Bishop of Raiwind and um, it's true, uh, Raiwind is not known for very much, but it is known for one thing, that it is the headquarters of the Tablighi Jamaat, which is the very large a missionary organization and we used to have a convention in Raiwind uh, of Muslim missionaries and uh, I will ask you to guess how many they got at that annual convention. How many do you think? Any guesses? 20,000. 20,000. Any other guesses? Five? I would go up if I were you. <laughs> Well, at that time they got 800,000 from all over the world, all over the world, 800,000. Now the present bishop tells me it's nearly a million. So we had to face this uh, organization. Of course, they claim that they are a missionary organization, they are completely non-violent. And again, I believe them. But the, the question is that sometimes people who come to some kind of fundamentalist view of Islam through these organizations, which may be non-violent themselves, then move on to something else. Because then, having been radicalized in this way, they can then be further radicalized. And there is some evidence, uh, particularly in the Western world, that this happens. Um, Part of the title of this talk is to do with the Arab Spring. Uh, I have to say the so-called um, Arab Spring. I don't know if that will command agreement here, but um, uh, the Western media and also some politicians had a love affair with what was happening. And they did not want to see, or perhaps they could not see, uh, other things that were happening that were not according to the way in which uh, they thought the Arab Spring was taking place. Um, <clears throat> there is a love affair with democracy and um, democracy is a good thing. Uh, but the, uh, there are a number of questions about democracy that have resulted from the Arab Spring. The, the first is um, whether people who have come to power through the ballot box are also willing to give up power through the ballot box. You see, you know, the test of democracy is not winning an election. You know, the test of democracy is losing an election. And there the jury is out. You see, once, I mean, many of these organizations believe in what is called Fath Mubin, manif the manifest victory of Islam. Once you've had a manifest victory in Gaza, let us say, uh, what happens if you lose the election? You know, what happens to the manifest victory? Uh, I mean, you may lose it to another Muslim group. Well, you would lose it to another Muslim group. But what would happen to the manifest victory? Secondly, uh, and this is more serious, I do not believe in the Middle East uh, or anywhere else for that matter that democracy is enough. 
you know, the West tends to speak as if democracy is all that is needed. But democracy in itself is not enough because uh, it could simply result in the tyranny of the majority. And the tyranny of the majority is no less tyranny because it's a tyranny of the majority. You know, the effects are the same on the people who suffer. Uh, maybe in the Western world we will see more of this in the future. But this is certainly true in the Middle East. Um, the present um, government in Egypt has won uh, an election, it has su supposedly won a referendum, but if you look at the absolute figures, they are not majority figures, they are actually uh, absolute minorities. But suppose there were majority figures, would that be enough? My own view is, uh, and uh, there is somebody here from Egypt who uh, may have uh, his view on this, uh, that Egypt needs very desperately at this time a Bill of Rights. Either a Bill of Rights as an independent uh, document or maybe something incorporated into the preamble to the constitution, into the new Dastur. Um, <clears throat> And uh, what would such a Bill of Rights contain? Well, it would contain uh, things that are familiar to us. It would, uh, uh, it would be clear that uh, there was one law for all, you see, that all Egyptians uh, would have the same law. Um, this may sound obvious to you, uh, but under Sharia, you see, the dhimmis can have to some extent their own law. But then what happens to freedom of expression, of belief, of the freedom to change your belief, of the freedom not to believe, for instance? Uh, I am a great admirer of the former Coptic Pope, Pope Shenouda. I met him about a year before he died. Uh, but one of the things uh, that he did say after the revolution, which caused me some concern, was that he said, well, if they want to have their Sharia, let them have Sharia as long as we have our own law. But that is precisely uh, what should not happen in Egypt, because that immediately reduces then the Christian population to dhimmi. One law for all, uh, the equality of all before the law. Uh, Abdullah Naeem, the Sudanese scholar, says, uh, Muslim scholar, says that um, in the uh, presuppositions of Sharia, there are three inequalities. There is the inequality between men and women, between Muslim and non-Muslim, and between slave and free. Well, leave slave and free aside for a moment. Uh, what about Muslim and non-Muslim? I mean, we have in Pakistan the Evidence Act that in law discriminates between Muslims and non-Muslims in terms of giving evidence in the courts, for example. And also women, it also discriminates against women. Um, and yeah, that is the other great inequality, the status of women. Uh, I can come to that in a moment, in, in, particularly in terms of family law. Um, so uh, a commitment to the equality of all before the law, and thirdly, some statement about a common citizenship. You know, when the Ottoman Empire abolished the dhimma and the millet system in the 19th century, gradually uh, Christians and also other minorities, at that time there were significant Jewish populations, uh, in these countries found themselves for the first time since the rise of Islam equal citizens. This is what led to the Nahada, to the rise of Arab nationalism in which Christians contributed uh, out of all proportion to their numbers. Uh, the list of uh, Arab writers on the Nahada, uh, Constantine Zurek, Anton Farah, Michel Aflaq himself, uh, Butros Ghali, the ancestor of the present Butros, Butros Ghali and so forth. But they were able to do this because they were at last recognized as fellow citizens. 
Now what we don't want in Egypt and elsewhere is uh, a withdrawal uh, back to the status of Dhimmi for this common citizenship that has been uh, achieved in, in such a hard way. Um, Western politicians uh, sometimes, oh dear, sorry, no, I mustn't do things like that, this has fallen off. Okay, is that all right? Anyone affected? I, I'm, I've, I'm absolutely uh, laden with all sorts of devices here, but has anyone been affected? <laughs> no, right. Um, uh, Western politicians uh, sometimes claim that this phenomenon of Islamism that we are seeing even in its extreme forms is due to economic circumstances. And if you change the economic circumstances, the phenomenon will disappear. Now, uh, it is true that in the great cities of the Arab world, for example, Algiers or Cairo, it is true that there is now a large cohort of young men, I use all those words advisedly, uh, who have had enough education to know they are not getting what they should be getting. And so they are easy recruits to one kind of Islamism or another, that is true. In the rural areas on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, on the other hand, uh, there are large numbers of rural families um, who cannot afford to educate their children. This is partly because of the failure of the educational policies of the government of Pakistan. I say this openly. So what do they do? They have to send their children to the madrasas. It is there they are, that they are radicalized. The word Taliban means students. And students where or of what? Students of the madrasas. These people are then used um, as the shock troops of the Taliban. Uh, this is why uh, the solution to the question of the Taliban does not lie in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan. Uh, and you will see that that will be so, if God willing, there is a solution uh, to this issue. So it is true that economic circumstances aid recruitment to Islamism, but Islamism in either form cannot be equated with these economic circumstances, as sometimes uh, Western media comment and politicians seem to do. Secondly, some even Christian religious leaders, um, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Williams, um, said this himself in, in an article in the Times, that uh, a true Islamic state would ensure the freedom of Christians and other minorities. Well, I have seen attempts at a true Islamic state in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Iran, and also elsewhere uh, in northern Nigeria. And I cannot say hand on heart that a true Islamic state uh, would mean an easy life or an easier life for Christians and others. Uh, this is a completely mistaken view uh, and it leads to a kind of false optimism that we should not entertain. I mean, we have to be realistic. The third thing that is often said, uh, and this is illustrated by the events in London, uh, the first reports in the Western media said this was an attack of Islamist extremism. The subsequent reports dropped the term Islamist. So extremism, well, Marxist extremism or Hindu extremism or Christian extremism. I mean, what kind of extremism are we talking about? And uh, it is a mistaken kind of uh, view that we must not identify what kind of extremism. Well, if we don't, how are we ever going to find the answer? Um, these people uh, understand their program and their mission to be rooted 
in Islam. Uh, many moderate Muslims feel they are completely mistaken about this. Uh, they may be. It is not for me to say, I mean, I'm not a Muslim. What I can say is that when my moderate Muslim friends have said that this is a mistaken interpretation of Islam, in nearly every case that I can think of, it is the extremist interpretation that has prevailed and not the moderate. Now, I regret this very much, but uh, the fact has to be recorded. Uh, why this is so, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think we would have to, um, to ask our friends about it. Now, with this uh, in the background, some comments on a number of countries in which I know you are interested and I certainly am. Uh, the West um, uh, spent a great deal of money and time and um, some heroic work by the armed forces uh, in enforcing the no-fly zones in Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq. I was once asked by a pilot um, to sit in the cockpit that he flew the no-fly zone um, part of his duties. And um, he, to, to make me feel, I said, how long do you sit? It's a tiny space. I said, how long do you sit in this cockpit? And he said, seven hours. Because they take off, they operate the no-fly zone, they come back without going to the toilet, without having any drink, you know. So that was the human cost of operating the new no-fly zone. And of course, what it meant was the survival of the Kurdish uh, people and the Marsh Arabs, the Kurds in the north and the Marsh Arabs in the south. And uh, whatever else you say about what happened next, uh, that is laudable. Um, I was in Iraq um, fairly recently. I know John and others go there also. Uh, the different communities in Iraq, Shia and Sunni, uh, many of them in many parts, are protected physically by walls. You know, people criticize the wall in Jerusalem that the Israelis have built, but Baghdad is full of walls. Green wall, red wall, yellow wall, you know, all sorts of walls behind which people are protected. They have their own militias that are, supposed, are supposedly there to protect them. But the Christians in Iraq have no such protection. They are particularly exposed to attack and have been uh, savagely attacked. Their clergy, their bishops, uh, lay people, their shops, their homes, their churches. Now, of course it is right for the West to be concerned about the safety of the Kurdish people and the Marsh Arabs. But what about Christians in Iraq? Who is concerned for their safety? And how can their safety be ensured? Some Iraqi Christians think there might be some territorial provision for them, as there has been for the Kurdish people and may soon have to be also for the, um, for the Shia uh, community in the south. Uh, and maybe also for the Sunni. I mean, in the end, <laughs> uh, I think the future of Iraq is, if there is a future, is a very loose confederal arrangement and not a unitary state. But if not, how is the international community to safeguard this ancient community which predates the coming of Islam to Iraq by many centuries. And not just Christians, but other communities like the Yazidis, the Mandeans, um, and others. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, uh, the situation in Syria. Um, whatever we may say about the Assad regime, and it is true that what is happening now in Syria is payback time uh, for what happened under this President Assad's father's rule when he tried and succeeded to a large extent in suppressing the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood. 
and uh, no one can in any way approve of what he did at that time. And as I say, this is now the turn of the brotherhood to pay back the son for what the father did. But uh, Syria is a very delicately balanced society. Uh, not only are there Christians there, there are also Druze, uh, and uh, there are many different kinds of Muslims, the Alawites, uh, the mainstream Shia, the Sunni of course, the Sufi oriented people and so forth. How will this delicate balance, which I think the, whatever else you say about the Assad regime, it has succeeded in maintaining. If a Salafi Wahhabi government is facilitated by what the Western powers and Saudi Arabia and Qatar are doing at the moment in Syria. What will happen to this balance? And also, what will be the international situation with a Salafi Wahhabi regime right on the doorstep of Israel? Okay, I mean, the, uh, the Assads have found a, to some extent, a Cold War type of modus vivendi with Israel. We cannot assume that will carry on. And what will happen then? Uh, Afghanistan, the Western uh, intervention in Afghanistan has meant, no question about it, greater freedom for the people of Afghanistan, greater freedom than they have ever known under any regime whatsoever. Especially the women, uh, the possibility simply of going to school of having a job, of going out into the streets to, for, to the shops, uh, all of which had been curtailed by the Taliban. And uh, I hope uh, for the sake of um, our common humanity that the Taliban will never return to power in Afghanistan, never, because of the uh, incredible uh, human rights abuses of which they were guilty, particularly against women and girls, but not only that. Uh, also cultural vandalism and uh, many other things. So Afghanistan is in a, in a better place, no doubt, but not for Christians, not for Christians. Uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman uh, became a Roman Catholic Christian in Afghanistan and was uh, arrested for apostasy and tried and convicted to death for apostasy. This was one of the agenda items for our dialogue with Al-Azhar one year. And I said to a friend of mine, uh, an Afghan lawyer who is uh, one of the prominent uh, uh, Sharia lawyers, who was responsible, one of the people responsible for the new Afghan constitution, I said to him, what are you doing? The West is spending billions of dollars in Afghanistan. You have drafted along with others the new constitution and yet Mr. Abdul Rahman can still be convicted to death, sentenced to death for apostasy. And he said to me, he said, look Michael, we have done the best we could. We have even incorporated the UN Declaration of Human Rights in the preamble to the Afghan constitution. But, he said, no one in Afghanistan can trump the Sharia. So, what does that mean? What is the value of this constitution, of democracy? Um, we have to ask ourselves, uh, Pakistan, Pakistan is a paradox, uh, it's the same word in German. <laughs> um, on the one hand you have a multi-party political system, they've just had elections and this time unusually a clear result. Uh, a reasonably independent higher judiciary, sometimes too independent. Uh, a free press, reasonably free press, civil institutions, uh, so civil society can appear to be quite strong. Uh, 
And yet, I mean that is all on one side, on the other side, uh, terrorists have untrammeled freedom to do whatever they like. Kill whoever they like, occupy whatever they like, uh, change the character of society in any way that they want, threaten women and girls who are receiving education. Uh, uh, Roman Catholic school in Swat Valley when the Taliban occupied it that had been educating girls for seventy-five years, mainly Muslim girls, was blown up. You know. Um, so, um, the, um, the big question from the, from the legal point of view in Pakistan is the blasphemy law. Uh, this is a specific law uh, which prescribes the death penalty particularly for insulting the Prophet of Islam. But of course Christian belief itself can be taken as a form of an insult. You know, if Christians believe that uh, prophecy came to a climax and to fulfillment in Jesus, well it is difficult for them to recognize any other such prophet after that. Well, that itself can be taken as an insult. You know, the, the very belief of a non-Muslim uh, or even sometimes a Muslim, if you include the Ahmadiyya amongst the Muslims, can be taken as blasphemy without them saying anything more than that. Uh, every attempt um, to modify the law, uh, even to make administrative um, provisions to ease the force of the law have been resisted uh, by the ulama. Even to the recent killing of the governor of the Punjab, progressive Muslim Salman Tasir, and the Christian minister for minority affairs, uh, Shahbaz Bhatti. Um, One of the things that uh, will be seen in the future uh, is the importance of uh, Shia-Sunni relationships in this part of the world. I went to see my senior surviving uncle, who is a Shia religious leader still in Bahawalpur in Pakistan uh, about a year, eighteen months ago. And he said to me, he said, well, we sympathize with what is happening to your community, but just listen to what I have to say about three of your own cousins in the last few weeks. So I said, well, what happened? I had never met them, by the way. He said they were in the Shia mosque. The lashkar e jhangvi one of the Islamist extremist groups, came to kill the imam. The imam had gone home, so they killed these three boys. Now that is a microcosm of what is going to happen throughout the region. That the, the region will be characterized by a huge scale Shia Sunni conflict. This is already happening in Iraq, it is uh, happening in Syria, it will be exported to the Lebanon if it, Lebanon needs any export. It may well be exported to Turkey because the, uh, there is a large number of uh, Shia in Turkey, often that is not understood. Uh, it is already happening in Pakistan on a large scale. What would be the reaction to this in Iran, for example? Um, what then happens to uh, Christian groups uh, will be seen in the context of this larger conflict, Shia-Sunni conflict uh, in, in the region. Um, of course, we also have to ask um, to, to balance the discussion, what about uh, Muslim minorities in non-Muslim society? Uh, I, I say this deliberately because uh, the West is not the only case, you know. Uh, I mean, India has a non-Muslim, uh, has a Muslim minority, a non-Muslim country has a Muslim minority that is larger than the population of Pakistan, you know. So there's another Pakistan sitting in India, if you like, if you can imagine it. 
Um, and many other examples um, can be given. Sri Lanka next door is another example. Um, but of course, we also now have significant Muslim populations in many Western European countries, Britain, France, Switzerland, Belgium, uh, Holland, and so on. Germany, of course. Uh, did I mention Germany? Yes, I have now, anyway. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, to some extent, this is up to the Muslim communities, uh, but it is also for the host uh, communities to decide uh, what the future will look like. Um, the policies of multiculturalism in Britain have been a failure. Uh, instead of welcoming the new situation on the basis of Christian hospitality, Christian engagement, uh, Christian service, multiculturalism was created on the basis of mere tolerance. You know, mere tolerance, at least in Britain, means leaving people alone. And when you leave people alone, what happens? They become isolated, people become segregated one from another, there is no communication, no idea of a common citizenship, and of course, most of all, in this situation, the opportunity for extremists to radicalize the young. So that is what has happened. Um, uh, in um, classical Sharia, uh, a Muslim is required to emigrate from a situation where he or she cannot observe the Sharia. And to observe the Sharia, <coughs> Uh, in the end, you need people who will interpret the Sharia for you and judge in cases that involve Sharia, you see. Um, well, um, do Western societies and other non-Muslim societies provide uh, enough for Muslims um, to live according to Sharia or not? I mean, that is... You know, that is the big question that will increasingly be asked and more and more loudly in different uh, such jurisdictions. In India, there has already been huge conflict on this question. Um, <clears throat> and so that brings me to the, to the final part of uh, what I want to say, which is, what are the issues that have been raised by the situation that I am describing? The first has to do with the role of religion in public life. The West particularly has got used to the, what may be called the Westphalian uh, situation. After the Treaty of Westphalia, the separation of religion from public life. Now, Islamism in the West and elsewhere means this is no longer an option. You see, this is, that option is gone now. There can no longer be a Westphalian consensus. So the question is not whether religion should have a role in public life, but what sort of role? And here we have to say clearly that the role cannot be theocratic. The rejection of theocracy on every side. Uh, the reaction, uh, the, um, uh, the relationship of religion to uh, public life cannot be that of coercion. Coercion uh, of being forced. Uh, but it has to be one of persuasion. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, we must uh, contribute to public life, but on the basis of the strength of our arguments, rather than on the basis of privilege or because we claim uh, some kind of legal or religious tradition. Um, will our partners in dialogue be willing to accept such a role? for Islam. Some Muslims will be and others will not be. 
The question of democracy, uh, I have mentioned already some of the difficulties. Uh, democracy in the form that we have it now has arisen because of a Christian view of the person. I mean, people go back to Athenian democracy and Greek democracy and so forth, but that was very selective democracy only, it only applied to free men. Not to women and not to slaves. Aristotle calls slaves living tools. You know, that is all they were. Uh, if you go to Greek cities, uh, ancient Greek cities, you will find plenty of public facilities for men, none for women. So what we are talking about is the origin of the democratic idea under the influence of um, Christian teaching of men and women being in God's image. And of course that democratic idea has extended itself in a number of ways. Uh, do people from a non-Judeo-Christian background, can they develop democracies in their own terms? That's a question. Uh, some Muslims claim that there is material, for example, the Shura idea in the Quran uh, and in certain um, cultural contexts, the idea of uh, Be'a, of uh, offering allegiance to a, a leader, thus legitimizing his or her rule, uh, or the idea of the Jirga system, which, is, which was reformed and used uh, recently in Afghan constitution making, that these can be used to foster democracy. Uh, that may be, uh, but um, what we have to see is uh, whether those two things that I pointed out to you before, whether people are willing to lose power democratically, um, and um, secondly, whether uh, provision can be made for fundamental human rights in addition to democratic provision in, the, in these contexts. Uh, thirdly, the question of the relationship of religion to law. Now, in the Western context, um, law has largely arisen um, from Christianized Roman law and from the canon law of the church. But it, uh, public law has achieved an autonomy uh, which is independent of any particular religious tradition. And I think that that is right, that is how it should be. So the question then is in the West, but this may apply also elsewhere, uh, what would be the situation of Sharia in relationship to public law? Uh, some years ago, you may remember the former Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chief Justice, the highest judicial officer in England, uh, uh, publicly argued that Sharia should be recognized in terms of public law. Now, uh, <clears throat> when they were criticized for that, they said, oh, we, we don't mean a cutting off of hands and exec public execution. We don't mean that. What we mean is the softer aspects of Sharia. Uh, for example, family law. Well, uh, suppose fam Sharia family law was recognized in public law. What would happen? You see, we go back to those fundamental inequalities that An Naim has pointed out in, in Sharia. Um, in Britain, bigamy is a crime, uh, probably the same in Switzerland. Um, if Sharia law is recognized, would it be a crime only for some people and not for others? So what happens to equality of all before the law? Uh, divorce, a man can divorce a woman much more easily than a woman can divorce a man even if she can persuade a judge to grant a divorce. You know, where is the equality there? Uh, custody of children. At the very time that the Lord Chief Justice was saying Sharia law should be recognized in terms of public law in Britain, uh, the law lords who were the highest judicial court at that time in the country, they now call themselves the Supreme Court, the same people, 
different name. Uh, but the custom was at that time that when the law lord sat to hear appeals, a bishop sat with them and uh, led them in prayers before they decided and so on. And I happened to be the bishop on duty that day, so I sat with them. And they were ruling on the appeal of a Lebanese Muslim woman against deportation. And they ruled that the woman could not be deported to the Lebanon because if she was under Sharia law, her son would be taken from her and given to her husband. And this would be a violation, they said, of her fundamental human rights. At the same time, as the chief law officer was saying, recognize uh, Sharia family law in terms of public law in the country. What about inheritance? I mean, I am myself an example of this. Uh, that a non-Muslim cannot inherit from a Muslim, cannot inherit from a Muslim. Uh, there is inequality between women and men again in inheritance law. Uh, the question of jihad, we have mentioned it uh, but we haven't addressed it in detail. It is possible uh, in terms of uh, a Muslim understanding to think of jihad in ways that have to do with social reform or uh, with a deepening of spirituality. It is possible to do that. It is also possible to use related words in terms of uh, development in Sharia. That of course is the possibility of which is denied by Islamists. Um, some Muslims are now talking about jihad in terms of self-defense. But historically, um, jihad has meant, uh, well, what has been called opening the way for Islam in lands that are not Muslim. So when the Ottoman Caliph claimed to be Caliph, what he was doing was opening up lands. Which lands was he opening up? Southern and Eastern Europe. And as you know, the Ottomans reached right to to the gates of Vienna before they could be stopped. Uh, I was watching a debate in Egypt on television between a secularist and an Islamist and the secularist was saying, why did the Muslims come to Egypt? And he said it was to open the way, the Islamist said it was to open the way of Islam. So he said, now you open the way you can go back. <laughs> but of course there is no going back, there is no going back. Finally, reciprocity. Um, we are of course, I am of course, tempted to say very often uh, that uh, there are church, there are mosques. Um, I know uh, Switzerland has a special provision about this, but in many countries of uh, Western Europe there are mosques. Uh, and I believe it is right for these mosques to exist because of the principle of freedom of uh, religion. But in many Muslim countries, it is impossible to have churches. Much, I mean, let alone Saudi Arabia. I'll tell you a story about Saudi Arabia in a moment. But in Egypt, much of the violence against Christians is because they have been accused of building a church or repairing a church or building a church hall or whatever it may be. I was given, when I was Bishop of Rywind, a plot of land in a nice middle class area very educated people living round about. And they came to me and they said, Bishop, please don't build a church here. Build a school and we will send our children to your school, but don't build a church. Why not? <coughs> Another church that we did build, the present bishop was telling me, 25 years later, they have, the Muslim community round about has not allowed this church to be used. So this temptation exists. I was talking to a long-serving Saudi ambassador in London about this. Uh, and I said, you know, you have mosques here in London, Regent's Park Mosque, hundreds of mosques. What about some churches in Saudi? And he said, but there are no mosques in the Vatican. <laughs> that was his answer, seriously. The Vatican is one square mile, maybe. <laughs> You know, what kind of answer is that? So we are tempted uh, to 
speak of reciprocity in this way. However, I have to say that uh, this can become tit for tat. And my approach in dialogue uh, has been uh, to seek a common commitment to human freedom by the partners of dialogue as a proper expression of reciprocity. And in this there have been some modest successes as also some very dramatic failures, I, I have to say. Um, dialogue can have many different um, reasons to listen to people, of course, to understand where they are and what they believe and how they wish to live. Uh, it can be about uh, exchange of um, ideas. It can be, I believe, an occasion for Christian witness. Just as we listen to what our partners are saying, we can also witness to, to our faith. Um, and it can also be for the building up of community. But I have found increasingly in my work, especially since I began this work about four years ago, that dialogue is more and more about a common commitment to fundamental human freedoms. And if we don't have that, in the end there will be no dialogue at all. Um, so I um, want to end with that. Thank you very much uh, for your patience and I look forward to the discussion now, Benjamin. Thank you.